This is a chart of Singapore's GDP per capita since independence, growing over 125 times to become a high-income nation. Rarely in the history of humanity has a nation travelled the path from poverty to riches so quickly or completely. But how did Singapore do it? What are the secrets to Singapore's success? To understand the economy of Singapore, we must briefly look at its history. Singapore got its start in life as a venture of the British East India Company in the early 18th century, due to its strategic location between India, China and Southeast Asia. By the late 1800s, it had been fully incorporated as a crown colony of the British Empire, becoming an important naval base in the Far East. The stability and infrastructure provided made the island an attractive option for migrants, with the island's population growing rapidly. However, fast forwarding to 1965 and Singapore's position wasn't great. Whilst it was considered more wealthy than other parts of the region, this was relative. Poverty was a huge problem. High unemployment and political, economic and racial tensions being such an issue that Malaysia decided to part ways with Singapore, leaving the newly independent nation in, well, a bit of trouble. Luckily for Singapore, it had just the man for the job, Lee Kun Yew. You see, he was a lawyer by trade, and he understood the fundamental importance of the law, stability, and keeping friendly relations with large international corporations. Which leads us very nicely onto the next section. What helped Singapore become a success in the early years? Without a doubt, a lot of Singapore's early success was due to effective government policy. And whilst a business-friendly environment was important, one of Singapore's most crucial early strategies focused on housing. You see, at independence, housing on the island wasn't great. The city was surrounded by slums, lacking even the most basic sanitation and services. So, with that in mind, one of the first things the government did was pass the Land Acquisition Act. This controversial law enabled the government to buy up land cheaply. But importantly, this was largely used to move people into better housing. And make no mistake, this was a big deal. With around 80% of the population living in publicly built housing today, Singaporeans are lucky enough to be able to buy these homes at a discount, giving them a vital stake in the nation's prosperity, personal wealth and stability. Interestingly, public housing in Singapore also has racial quotas, as social stability is a huge concern for the government, especially given its multicultural nature. But even with support, Singapore's housing is extremely expensive. To help citizens overcome this, the government allows them to use money from the Central Provident Fund, a savings fund that all working nationals have to pay into, being fundamental to the wealth of its citizens, with each citizen having their own personal savings account. The fund is also mandatory, meaning citizens have to save, whether they like it or not, and the contributions aren't small either. Saving rates start at 20% of your monthly wage, being topped up by employers. These savings can then be used for things like your pension, housing, medical expenses, and even university education for yourself or a family member. The return on these savings is very attractive too, achieving about 5%, an incredible rate for a government savings account, especially when you consider that its official central bank rate is a fraction of that, going a long way to explaining why the nation has one of the highest saving rates in the world, at over 53%. Now, as just highlighted, a common theme for Singapore is that a lot of its success is dependent on effective government policy. But why is good governance especially important for Singapore? Whilst good governance is important to any economy, it matters just that little bit more to Singapore, especially during its rise to fame. Unlike so many of its neighbours, Singapore lacks any meaningful natural resources. And if you were to compare it to any of the other four First Asian Tiger economies, the nation has the smallest population by far. So, in order to attract vital foreign direct investment, Singapore made a huge effort to fight corruption and make it as easy as possible to do business. 
factors which are just as relevant today, as the nation ranks second for the ease of doing business. You see, Singapore's development was built on the back of attracting multinational corporations to invest in its manufacturing base. Initially low-skilled manufacturing, but quickly transitioning to higher skilled sectors like semiconductors or aerospace. And contrary to popular belief, Singapore isn't just some huge private bank today. Manufacturing is still the largest sector of the economy, at over 20%, with semiconductors its largest export. This reliance on manufacturing may seem strange for a highly advanced economy well known for its finance, though a fundamental reason for this again lies with good governance, this time through Singapore's National Wage Council. Set up in 1972, the council focuses on keeping good relations between three vital stakeholders, the government, businesses and trade unions. Its key role is to ensure that wages only increase in line with productivity over the long term, allowing exports to maintain a competitive edge, as output per worker rises with cost per worker, in theory. But hang on to that thought, as we're going to be discussing how difficult that has become later on. Nonetheless, all of Singapore's strategies and business-friendly policies are especially important when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment to Singapore the economic impact of which cannot be understated, with the nation being the third largest recipient of net FDI according to the World Bank, a measure which looks at all the incoming investment from non-residents after accounting for any which is repatriated or used to pay off loans. And remember for context, Singapore is a tiny island of not even 6 million people, yet its net FDI is more than double India's and almost triple Japan's. But it's not just the amount of FDI that Singapore receives that is important, it is how it has gone about deploying this over the years. So how does Singapore use this foreign direct investment? to its advantage. From the very beginning, Singapore recognised foreign corporations as its path to riches. In the absence of any meaningful natural resources, Singapore knew that its true asset was its people. As the foreign investment poured in, the nation ensured it would not just take the extra cash, but would learn from these companies through nationwide strategies, like setting up technical schools and paying for these companies to upskill its workforce in areas such as IT, electronics and petrochemicals. This strategy was a huge part of how Singapore was able to transition from low-skilled exports of textiles in the 1970s to things like biotech, semiconductors and aerospace engineering by the 1990s. Now, it's worth mentioning that education is big business in Singapore. The nation frequently ranks top for international standardised testing and has the highest human capital index in the world at 0.88, meaning that a child born today is likely to be 88% as productive as they could have been by the time they reach 18, indicative of good healthcare and education. But people aren't the nation's only asset. Many economists often comment on the island's fantastic location. Though, what does Singapore's great location mean in practice? Ultimately, the country acts as a regional hub, having built a reputation for providing the services its neighbours need and a gateway for international corporations who want to operate in the region. The best example of this is Singapore's shipping industry. The port of Singapore is the world's second largest by volume after Shanghai. However, it ranks first in the world for transshipment which is essentially where ships change cargo before reaching their final destination. And this stretches beyond the port, with Singapore Airport following a similar theme, being a connecting hub for flights further afield. And all of this enables the country to deploy something called network effects, where because other ships and airlines are already there, the country can provide a high frequency of travel options vital to being considered a hub which creates a self-reinforcing cycle of network effects, with tourism being a huge beneficiary of this, especially as infrastructure has continued to improve. Now, networking effects aside, its strategic location positions the island nicely for exports, including some exports you may not necessarily imagine. 
Despite having virtually nothing in the way of natural resources, Singapore's second largest export is refined petroleum products. Being the world's fourth largest player, this is all thanks to possessing one of the largest oil refineries in the region, again highlighting its role as a regional services provider for others. With all of these factors, setting up the nation to be an ideal export-based economy. But just as fundamental is understanding how it uses its export-earned riches. So, how does Singapore use its export income? The nation's export success enabled it to become an early adopter of sovereign wealth funds. Now, sovereign wealth funds are actually a pretty broad term, but in essence, they are a pool of money the country can deploy to do things like provide pension income, investment in infrastructure, or stabilize the national budget. And Singapore has not one, but two sovereign wealth funds, both of which are amongst the top 10 in the world with combined assets of nearly $1 trillion. The first of these, the Tamasek Sovereign Wealth Fund, was formed out of government-owned companies and is still heavily involved in the nation's industries, playing a crucial role in funding the nation's companies. Whilst its second fund, GIC, acts more like an asset management company, keeping a tight control on the nation's financial assets. Now, one of the final pieces in our economic jigsaw puzzle is understanding how Singapore's assets are crucial to understanding its economy. For example, just take a look at this chart of the nation's gross debt. And I'm aware I said debt when talking about assets. The country has the sixth highest gross debt to GDP ratio in the world. Though, what if I told you that its debt was actually zero? Now, this isn't a trick once we move away from gross debt to consider net debt which is essentially debt, less any assets. And in Singapore's case, it falls to zero. In fact, the country is actually a creditor. You see, whilst it's true that the nation borrows, it's actually illegal for the government to borrow for consumption, only for investment. And these investments are revenue generating assets, meaning that despite having the sixth highest gross debt to GDP ratio in the world, the country can maintain a AAA credit rating. However, to be fair, despite an impressive economy, it faces its own economic challenges. So what are Singapore's main challenges? Well, firstly, inequality is a real issue. Although the average citizen is amongst the wealthiest in the world, this hides real wealth inequality. The nation has a fairly high Gini coefficient of 0.45, which is a measure of income distribution. But this does drop to below 0.4 after accounting for progressive taxes and government transfers. The nation's affordability, or a lack of it, can also not be understated. Due to the government's regulations, owning a car is extremely expensive. In fact, it's the most expensive place on the planet. Though, to be fair, this is a policy designed to encourage public transport use. Singapore has an excellent public transport system, which is less of a problem for a small island nation. Likewise, housing affordability, especially in the private sector, is ludicrously expensive again being amongst the highest in the world. Noticing a pattern? Now, changing the subject away from affordability, during this video, we've mentioned a lot of government policies and how effective they have been, but they have come at a cost. Critics suggest that the ruling party, in power since independence, has acted with authoritarian tendencies at times, something reflected in the freedom of the nation's press. Ranking 158th in the world, according to the World Press Freedom Index, being less free than places like Venezuela. Though, to be fair to the government, it has enjoyed widespread support. As mentioned towards the beginning of the video, productivity is a hot topic on the island as well, particularly in recent years. Whilst this is disputed, research suggests the nation has underperformed its top trading partners, with the gap widening, something attributed to the low growth in labour force productivity, and most of the growth achieved being concentrated in just a handful of sectors. The real concern here though, is that low productivity risks impacting profitability, a point economists suggest is already beginning to happen, with researchers suggesting the return on equity and assets have declined over the last decade, 
in six out of the top 10 sectors. But perhaps the nation's main challenge is its low birth rate, partly a result of how expensive it is to raise a family on the island, and a common trend amongst similar high-income countries. This demographic challenge creates a deep reliance on migrant workers for its labour supply, something which has been a key source of population growth for decades, though arguably the island's ability to act as a magnet for both capital and labour is as key a reason as any for its success. So overall, Singapore, just like any country, has its own set of challenges, though its economic success has been undeniable. At its core has been effective governance, whether that be through housing, public savings, pro-business policies, or how it invests in its greatest asset, people. But the policies Singapore has been able to adopt are also partly a product of it basically being a city-state. Whether these same policies could work on a much larger scale, one less easy to manage, is a whole other question. And now, it's over to you. What do you think is the secret to Singapore's success? Or do you think it's actually not as successful as others think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you think we've earned it, consider leaving a like or subscribing. It really helps grow this channel. And as always, see you in the next video.